Since 2010, Caroline Lucas has been the Green Party's sole MP in the UK. In June, she announced that she won't be re-standing at the next general election and so the Greens are looking for a new candidate in her constituency of Brighton Pavilion. I'm going to be joined by the third and final of those candidates today. But before I introduce them, I have one thing to ask of you, which is that you scroll down right now and hit subscribe. So without further ado, I'm absolutely delighted today to be joined by Dan Rue. Dan, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing all right, thanks. Thanks for having me. An absolute pleasure to be joined by you today. So let's kick things off nice and easy then. Why are you standing to be the Green Party's next candidate for Brighton Pavilion? Yeah, um, well, why am I standing? I think, firstly, I'm a you know, relatively junior member in the party. Um, I think I, you know, I have a lot to offer as a, a candidate in what's likely to be you know, a year-long campaign and will hopefully be you know, a member of Parliament for Pavilion. Um, just to kind of speak on, on recently, you know, I stood as a, a local candidate um, in the Pavilion wards up here in Patcham. You know, unfortunately, it was unsuccessful. And, you know, as you'll know, we had a, a bit of a disappointing time um, across, across the city for the Greens. But, you know, despite that, in the area where we stood um, with my team, you know, a strong conservative area, we're still able to, to grow our share of the vote. Um, I think that really came down to kind of engaging with voters um, and connecting with them. Uh, off the back of that, joining the, the local exec as a, you know, a young green organizer opportunity came up I thought um, it was really good chance to kind of offer something different to the contest um, and offer something different to, to local members uh, really. Um, obviously we knew before the announcement that Sean would be standing as local candidate um, and again I thought this is a good opportunity obviously Sean's a big presence obviously going to be a clear a clear favourite but I thought it was a good opportunity to kind of come in and represent young members and local local members as well so I live in the pavilion and kind of offer something new to the Greens maybe out of what we've had before um I think it's probably fair to say you know, I'm a bit of an underdog in the process um but hopefully kind of through speaking with local members and stuff I've kind of been able to show I'm not just here for the ride um I do feel I have a lot to offer as a candidate what will be you know a tough election obviously we can't really bank on what would be Caroline voters to come out and vote for the Greens anymore we know Labour are going to make a really big push um, so I think we, we need someone who's going to actively go out and, and win votes and engage with people and most importantly is actually to get them out and go vote as well. So you mentioned there that you're a candidate in this year's uh, local elections and Viewers may or may not be aware, but this year in Brighton and Hove, the Greens went from running the administration as a minority um, administration to losing over half their seats. And it was a really bad night for the Greens. So what I wanted to ask you is, what do you think that the Green Party needs to learn from that set of local election results uh, going into the next general election to make sure the Greens can hold Brighton Pavilion? Yeah, I think, you know, as you say, it was a disappointing result. Obviously, we were, you know, a minority um, administration kind of picking up from where the, the Labour administration collapsed during the pandemic. So I think it was it was harsh. I, we were by no means perfect, but I think it was a, a harsh result and, and a lot of really good councillors lost their seats. Um, you know, in terms of what we can learn, I think, as I say, you know, I, I was out knocking on the doors of the pavilion. So, you know, I was able to speak to, to voters, you know, I understood their frustrations with, you know, as this administration, there's what a local council's doing, kind of what's happening in the country in general, and also kind of what matters to them, not just, you know, on their doorstep, on their street, but also what matters to them in their, the wider community. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it is really important. There are a lot of lessons to be learned, you know, despite the success we've had as a party quite quickly over the last couple of decades, I think it's you know, it's important to remember we're still a relatively young party. Um, probably specifically, I'd say, you know, we can be a bit better at communicating. I think so people can understand why decisions are made, not just during an election cycle, but also all year round. Um, maybe why things aren't the way they want them to be in their community. You know, if you look at the kind of the cuts that the government are made to local authorities is devastating. I don't think speaking to people, they fully understood the impact that had and kind of why their area wasn't looking the same they wanted it to. And uh, speaking directly in my ward up in Patcham, I think, you know, we saw the kind of Labour candidates come in the last two months and, 
you know, typical way throwing lots of money in, lots of leaflets. And I think they really control the narrative. So I think there's a, you know, a lot we can learn to, to, to grow as a party and improve. Um, as I say, by no means perfect, but we have lots of a lot of good councillors and I think we can learn and reflect. And I think by the next time uh, the local uh, elections come around, we can yeah, be in a better position and yeah, win back some more seats. So I want to talk to you now about, um, I guess, uh, what would happen if you were selected and then ultimately were elected as an MP. And the first question I wanted to ask you is, if you were selected and then ultimately became the MP for Brighton Pavilion, what would your political priorities be? Yeah, um, political priorities. I think, realistically, I think we're going to see a, you know, a Labour government come into power, whether that be with a big majority or a slim one, but I think we will see them in. So I think the primary goal or role of a green MP will just kind of be hold them to account. I think, you know, we've seen recently them all backtracking on a lot of policies, especially green uh, promises they've made. Um, so I think it's really important. We've got a green voice there saying, this is, you know, what the promise, this is what you need to stand for. Because I think, unfortunately, whilst I'd always back a Labour government over a Conservative one, I think we've seen them slowly slip into a few bad habits of maybe the conservative playbook, which is let's say and do whatever's going to win us votes. And I think it's important we kind of get them to go back to their um, morals of let's do the right thing. Um, big believer in proportional representations. That's something I'll always push heavily. I know Caroline was, I know something the Labour, Labour membership wants. So I think it is realistic we can get it. And I think it's important for us as a country to kind of move to proportional representation. Um, and yeah, I think as well, pushing for that support of local authority, obviously speaking from my knowledge of knowing how the situation was here in Brighton, speaking for local councillors, you know, about a fifth of the budget was cut. So I think we really need to see that support for local authorities come back because um, really they're the ones that make the changes to people's everyday lives, especially to working class people. So that's where we need a lot more money and support back into. But I think overall, Speaking on priorities, I think it's also important to remember that your priorities should be um, directed by your constituents and having conversations with them because at the end of the day, any MP is a representative. So, yeah, that's always something that should be playing in your mind. And again, thinking about, you know, after the next general election, if uh, everything goes the way you want it to go and you get selected and then you become the MP, you would be probably the most high profile uh, Green Party member in the country, um, you know, give or take, given, you know, it, it's possible that the Greens might win additional MPs in the next general election. Um, but in all likelihood, you'll be, if not the, one of the most high profile Greens in the party. And that has a bunch of additional responsibilities on top of it, beyond obviously the constituency representation, the parliamentary work, but also being one of the party's mo mo most prominent spokespeople. What experience have you got of being um, a you know a spokesperson for the party and how do you see yourself managing taking on that weight? Yeah um, I mean it was something that was playing in my mind a lot hopefully when I was thinking about um, kind of running as, as a candidate you know kind of what authority or experience do I have to stand am I in a position to kind of represent um, the Greens on the national stage even during the contest here locally obviously it plays national significance when you've got Caroline's name in the mix and I think Definitely, I'm sure any candidate will say it was something they were aware of about how big a presence Caroline is, is massive shoes to step into. Um, I think what's really important is about kind of establishing your own identity um, and kind of saying to people, you know, don't compare me to Caroline, you know, I'm trying to, I'm someone different. Um, you know, for me, I think I'm very aware there's, you know, areas to grow in terms of kind of public speaking and become the more effective communicator. Um, but in terms of kind of the experience and attributes, I think, you know, I'm bringing the hopefully it's kind of that ability to communicate with people, um, you know, relate to them. Um, I think it's really important that, um, especially when you're looking at the Green Party, you know, we're usually talking about the things that aren't getting spoke about day to day. You know, we're talking about important issues like taking action towards climate change and equality in society. Uh, and those are the kind of things that we really need to bring people along with you rather than try and dictate. So I think that's a really important skill to have. Uh, and I think, yeah, I have the ability to do that with people. And so now I want to talk to you about some, I guess, uh, challenging issues in the party over the last few years. And the reason I'm asking the candidates this is because I feel like 
members who are voting in this election will want to have a sense of where the candidates stand on these various issues, given that they have been particularly contentious in the Green Party. So to kick things off, I want to ask you about an issue that's um, been debated quite significantly over the last couple of years, and that's HS2. So where do you stand on HS2? Yeah, um, again, like these kind of issues, national, not always my area of expertise. And I think I would always say that's where it's important as maybe a junior member, it would be important to kind of appreciate the importance of having a strong team around you, relying on local knowledge and incorporating that. In terms of HS2, obviously it's developed quite a lot since where we stood on the policy back in 2019 with the manifesto. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of growth, I think, on the service, I think it's not a necessarily a bad thing. I think, you know, if you kind of look at some of the aspects of it to kind of offer better rail travel to people, that investment in local community, especially into the north, which is kind of historically under um, invested. Um, I think where we can grow as a party, something I mentioned before, is about being a bit more realistic. So obviously with HS2, we know it's it's already half done, the amount of money that's been put in. I think realistically, we need to say, okay, it's done, it's happening. Now what we what can we do? Um, I think that's where the Green representative comes in as they always have, which is, okay, are we looking at the environmental impact of this kind of investment and these decisions? Are we looking at the human impacts? Are we looking at um, responsible public spending? So I think, again, whoever the candidate is, it's important they kind of bring these issues to the forefront. And the second area I wanted to ask you about is uh, an area of policy that's recently changed for the Greens. So prior to the Green Party Spring Conference earlier this year, uh, the Greens had a position which was that Britain should withdraw from NATO, the military alliance that the UK is a part of. Um, after the decision that was taken at Spring Conference, the party's position now is to seek a series of reforms to NATO, um, but, to, but that Britain should maintain its membership of that alliance. Where do you stand on that issue? Yeah, I think it's uh, a good reflection on the party to kind of see where we've evolved on the issue. Obviously, with global events in Ukraine, it's kind of shifted everyone's understanding of how NATO works and the presence they have you know, in, in the world stage. Um, I think linking back to that answer before, you know, about being realistic, I think it shows we're growing as a party to what was maybe unrealistic as a start to say we want to leave to now being like, let's offer significant reform to NATO. I think that puts us in a lot better position um, to move forward. And then the final area I wanted to ask you about is transphobia. Uh, I think it's most members of the Green Party would understand that this has been an issue that's been rumbling on within the party for a number of years. And harking back to what I asked you earlier about being, you know, potentially the most high profile Green in the country, I wanted to ask you how you would use the position if you were selected and then ultimately elected as an MP to advocate for tackling transphobia within the Green Party? Yeah, um, okay, so I think, yeah, as you say, kind of any member of the Greens is gonna be in Parliament that comes with that element of leadership and standards of voice of the Greens, not just internally, but also um, externally as well. Uh, I think in regards to that, standing as a leader on these issues, you've always got the two sides about kind of showing that level of empathy and understanding, but also having that ability to be decisive and take action. Um, I think in terms of that empathy and standing, I think there's always areas to, to improve, especially with people, you know, we've seen a lot of hate towards the trans community, really. I think what we can do is just continue to show empathy, because really a lot of the hate, I feel at least, is spread from you know, misunderstanding and fear because people don't understand these changes that seems in society. So it's important just because people aren't necessarily allies yet, we don't turn them into enemies. So it's really important we bring people along with us when we're trying to make these changes. Um, but likewise, when you know, we're speaking about action, it's important with a likely Labour government, we, as I mentioned before, they're backtracking on their promises and not being as strong, especially towards the support to trans community. It's important we've got a strong voice saying, standing up and making sure they, they are standing out the hate, which, yeah, unfortunately we're seeing a lot more and it's, it's getting quite scary. So that was the last of my serious questions. I now have a series of slightly less serious questions that I like to end these on. The first of which is, which is your favourite and which is your least favourite Green Party policy? Okay. Um, favourite, you probably have to, it's only back to proportional representation, I'd say. It's something I, I feel quite strongly about. I'd like to see change. I think we can get there and I'm, I'm really proud of the stance we take as a party. I think we're really clear and leading the way. Um, least favourite. 
I'd probably say maybe not policy, but maybe something I thought we could be stronger on. I always thought we could be better at championing, championing ourselves and kind of speaking up for our successes. Um, but I think we have seen that recently, you know, we, we're growing. If you look at our successes in the local um, elections nationally, uh, if you kind of look at some of the socials, the engagement we're having, um, I think we're seeing a real shift where we make a lot more presence. And I think, yeah, we're, we're doing a good job there. Which book has most informed your politics? Book, okay. Um, I'm always shocking. I'm not a very good reader. I had to join the book club here in Brighton about a year and a half ago to force me to read. Um, I, in one part, I, I did read um, Barack Obama's book, A Promised Land. That was a really good one, I think. It's, it's a nice book, kind of about personal sacrifice, um, about kind of see in local um, politics and national politics, and also about kind of the impacts good local representatives can have. So, yeah. Um, who is your favourite historical figure? Oh, favourite historical figure. Um, I don't know. I, I would probably say JFK, but I feel like I'm always learning more, so maybe I should uh, update my favourite historical. I think as a younger person, you always look up to him as a kind of a young um, person, position of authority and making changes, changing culture. But um, yeah, maybe I need to update that one, some stuff I've learned recently. Uh, if you were Prime Minister for one day, what one change would you make? Um, one change. I think based off recent events, I think um, changes to having second and sometimes third jobs for MPs and maybe a cap on earnings. Um, I think that would maybe mean we can get uh, a better selection of uh, MPs nationally. So, yeah. And then my final one to finish on for you is who in the Green Party inspires you the most? inspires me most. I mean, Caroline obviously was the one who made me want to join originally. Um, I feel that's quite a standard answer. I'd say inspires me the most, especially in terms of wanting to stand in the local elections. And now is just the team here in Brighton. We have a really solid team of councillors in the, you know, in the exec. I had two amazing candidates down with me, Sophie and Norma, and I was really thankful that they nominated me for kind of this position here. And yeah, anyone who goes out leafleting on cold, windy days, all the young greens, yeah, I think they're the ones that inspire me. So. Well, as someone who did a little bit of leafleting on some cold and windy days in Brighton, I'm glad to know that I'm someone who inspires me now. <laughs> um, yeah. We'll leave it there. Thank you so much for joining me today. No, thank you. So that was the third and final of my interviews with the candidate standing in the Brighton Pavilion selection. Now you can catch the previous interviews if you haven't already with Sean Berry and Emily O'Brien, the two other candidates in the running there on our YouTube channel. So just head there and you'll be able to find them. The best way to make sure that you don't miss out on any of the videos and interviews like this that we put out is to hit subscribe. Right now we're running a series of interviews with the candidates in the Green Party executive elections. So if you want to catch them, make sure that you do subscribe. Whilst you're hitting that button, you can let us know what you thought about this conversation in the comments down below. If you're a member of Brighton Hove Green Party, you have until I, th I think it's the 19th uh, to vote. So make sure you get your vote in on time. Um, and finally, uh, if you are able to, please do head to bright-green.org forward slash donate to help fund these interviews and all the content we put out. So that's it from me today. Thank you all so much for watching and I'll see you all very, very soon.